Hello and welcome to the RPG Academy podcast. I am Michael and tonight we have a live faculty meeting. First time, not ever maybe, but certainly one of those. Um, and with me tonight, I have a very special guest co-host, uh, Jen Gagney. Yep. Uh, you probably know her better as Pixelscapes, uh, part of the Nerdicky network now, moving well, on up in the world. I've been, I've been uh, uh, sharing some of my videos there and I play in their D&D game. Well, that counts. So. Yeah. Well, well, welcome very nice. much uh, to great. our show. Thank you for joining us. Yes. Uh, so this has been a faculty meeting. The idea here is that Jen and I are going to talk a little bit about role-playing games and that we hope that through this conversation that we might be able to share some of the experiences that we have gleaned from our many years of playing tabletop RPGs. Uh, but we understand that the advice we give and the opinions we share may not work at every table every time. But there is one piece of advice that we do feel is pretty universal. And Jen, what is that one piece of advice? If you're having fun, you're doing it right. That is correct. So no matter what uh, game you play, the system or edition, what rules you use, don't use, or misuse, as long as you're having fun, then you're doing it right. Uh, so today's episode is going to be Faculty Meeting 120. I don't have a cool nifty title. It'll probably be something like Jen Shows Roll 20. Uh, <laughs> and this, this is sort of a follow-up to a recent episode I did with Mike Shea, who you might know as Sly Flourish, where we talked about uh, maps and minis versus theater of the mind and all the various ways that you can use maps and grids and all that kind of good stuff. And then we actually got quite a lot of positive feedback from that episode. But one of the things that came out is that Roll20 kind of does a lot of the things that we, we said that maybe... 3D terrain might be too expensive or too time consuming, but if you're using Roll20, it kind of does a lot of that work for you. I play games on the internet all the time, but all we use is Google Chat or a new program. It's basically voice and video. We don't do anything else. Uh, so Jen, you are the expert here. You are here to show us what we can do with Roll20. So I will essentially turn it over to you at this point. Uh, we do have several people who are already joined into the chat. So please, if you have any questions, uh, Jen, can you see the chat? Uh, let's see, which, which chat am I looking at? Here? It's going to be chat? on both Twitch and YouTube. So I can filter it if you want. I can read it. Yeah. And if then... you could filter it, that would be good. Okay. I'm going to be on my, my own screen here. Perfect. So okay. you, you start showing us things and I'll try to jump in with questions if they're uh, going to go on. Yeah. And definitely ask me your own questions. Like if there's anything you want to know or, or you have a point to make, whatever will help. All so, right. Um, I use Roll20 for all my games, even the games that I... Oh, so let's back this up. Roll20 <laughs> is a virtual tabletop. And what that what? means is you, <laughs> on your screen, you have the tools that you need to run a role-playing game. Um, and when you set up a particular game on Roll20, you decide what system you're going to use. So in this case, I'm using Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition. It comes with a standard character sheet. Um, and so for the demo, I have assigned you my husband's character sheet, which is Bishop Kepler. Is he a wizard of some sort? He is a, um, let's see, he's an eldritch knight. Close enough. Um, but we've reskinned all the magic as if it's gnome-powered cybertech implants. Ah, very cool. So he is very steampunk. Uh, and this is him right here. Oh, nice. That's that's my actual husband. That's what he looks like. <laughs> I'm assuming the eye is not, you know, yeah. actual. I, I, I love it. It's so terrible. You've got goggles with the monogle because <laughs> you can never have too many lenses in a cyberpunk setting. Absolutely. So, yeah. um, at any rate, so what Roll20 does is it gives you a set of tools you can leverage. Um, you can use as many or few of the tools that they leverage. Um, like you could use Roll20 just as a display and then continue using real dice and your monster manual in real life. Or, or you can play in person and sit on the couch and display stuff on the TV using Roll20. Or you can get on the other end of the spectrum all the way into it, have like your character sheet in here, run all your monsters from Roll20. Um, you can have dynamic lighting so that like you can't see around the corner until you get around the corner and you still can't see unless you have a light source and like and ah, monster. Get, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you can get that deep into it. So um, I'm going to show you uh, the, your spectrum of options here. Uh, and also in terms of like how deep you get into theater of the mind versus, you know, loose maps. I think it was that uh, Mike Shea calls it. 
uh, into uh, gridded maps, like that whole spectrum. Okay, sounds great. Uh, and again, anyone who's listening, I know there's a bit of a delay, but if you have any questions, please throw them out. I'll relay them to Jen where I have time to do so. But Jen, take it away. Awesome. So we are in Roll20. Uh, now, you and I are not using their native video and voice here. Um, partly it's because, of course, we're doing the show. Uh, but the other reason is it hasn't really worked all that well for about a year. I've uh, heard that. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. On the upside, they have just hired some um, experts in the web RTC tech that they use for that. And supposedly they're going to be rolling out updates within the next 60 days. Um, in my experience, the video is reliable enough that we try to use it. Uh, but for voice, we end up using either TeamSpeak or Discord. And that has more options anyway, so I'm, I'm good with that. Uh, so you see in the interface here on the upper left, there's this toolbar. Um, you probably see different options because you're not a GM, but it, there's an arrow that says select or move. I have options to pick which layer I'm on. There's like the map layer, the token layer, and then a GM layer that only I can see. Um, uh, special effects do uh yeah. fireballs for example oh okay let's see can i make yeah i'm seeing it but i i hit a button and we're back to that first screen that just has the four characters okay but i'm seeing a fireball yeah, effect uh okay. someone was mentioning that my audio was a little lower to yours so i had to jump over and try to fix that oh okay. so i lowered you instead of raising me but we should be closer but again if anyone listening if it's still not close i can adjust it a little bit more but every time i do that i, I mess jen up for a second so i'll just try to talk louder <laughs> carry on <laughs> so uh You've got zoom options, but you can also control that using the uh, control on the upper right. You see there's a little mini slider bar. And as you slide that up and down, it changes your zoom. Ah, uh, okay. And I'm not seeing that reflected in roll 20 though. Like I see what you're talking about, but I don't see any changes to the screen right now. So I don't know if maybe uh, I messed something up when I jumped over. Well, you can slide around the window, like just using the regular windows controls if you're zoomed in enough. Okay, so I'm doing it now and I can see it changing. I thought when you were okay. doing it that I would have seen it change. Right. So that was, that was no, my fault. Each person controls their own view. Ah, see, that's, that's okay. Now I'm with right. you. I'm, tr I'm picking up what you're throwing down. Uh, which kind of makes sense because, you know, as the GM, I could be like off in the corner grabbing some enemies that are about to come attack you and you don't want to see me go over there. <laughs> uh, and Or the party could be like split across a map. Uh, there's, there's, there's lots of, uh, difference or, there. Or there's me that I can't see. So I want, I might want to blow it up so I can actually see right. what's happening. Yep. And then there's a ruler tool that lets you measure how big things are. Good for range finding. You can probably see me using the ruler. Yeah. I see there's like a little bar with a 15 foot or five foot. Right. So yeah. I assume that you don't pick the measurement. You just drag and it does the measurement as you go. Yeah. So if you, if you want to see secretly, there's a grid, but you can't see it right now. Uh, so that's like a, the GM it's, layer thingy. It's, it's snapping to the grid. Uh, similarly, if we grabbed you and like moved you around, you'd snap to this, this grid that is secretly here. Now is, isn't that an option? Like when you set up the game, you have the option of snap to right. grid or not. So every time you set up a map, which they call pages, um, as a GM, you can tell it like what units is it doing using, uh, how big is it, um, is it using fog of war or is it using dynamic lighting, uh, uh, does it have a grid, things like that. Gotcha. Okay. Then I have some extra controls to like reveal areas. Um, there's the turn order for um, if we were going to run initiative through Roll20, which again, you don't have to do through Roll20, but you can. Uh, and then um, there's a dice roller. And uh, so if I hit D20, you see how my result pops up on the, if you have the chat open in Roll20. Yeah, it's just, just above the chat window. I see you wrote a 17. Yes, exactly. Uh, now, you know, we all love dice. Exactly. So if the, if the digital dice aren't fun enough for you, you can actually go under the gear icon on the upper right and you can enable 3D dice. Yeah. So 
Now, do I need to do that so that people can see mm -hmm. what I'm doing? Oh, okay. Yeah. So I'm hitting a little grid icon. Uh, then I got some enable 3D dice. All right. I hit that. Right. And then how do I get back to the without closing everything? Because uh, I have an so exit game. That would the be bad. little The little icons on the upper right, mm -hmm. there's a chat icon. And that's the one you want to go back to from the grid. Oh, actually, you'd not only enable 3D dice, I would say automatically roll 3D dice. It's the, another checkbox right next to it. Got it. Because otherwise you have to drag to roll the dice. All right. So I in rolled, heaven. but I think I don't think it was visible because my screen was in front of it. So let me do that again. There we go. All right. I rolled a five. This sucks. Yep. There you go. I'm I'm Matt Parody for the moment. It so, knows he he the Matt roll twenty dice hates Matt Parody. Oh. So you notice that our our the color of our die matches the little square next to our name. Yeah, so okay. You, you know who's rolling what. Ah, I got you. So the square That's at the all. bottom where it has our pictures, which mine is a I don't know what that is, but you're you have a nice picture. Right. You can turn those pictures off so it takes up less real estate if you want. Okay. Uh it's another thing under the gear. Under settings, okay. uh, see it says chat avatars, player video avatar size. You can change it to names only. Uh, how far down is that? It would be halfway down. Uh, okay, avatar. I got regular, small names only. There right. we go. There you go. Okay. Okay. Just gives a little, little extra room. Cool. So uh, let's see. So we could run our whole game if we wanted, just using this as like our theater of the mind desktop, if you will. And then the only, and you just have your character portraits up here, right? And uh, you could just use this as a shared interface and use the video, but it's a little more fun if you have other options here. Uh, so, for example, you see these green bars over the characters. Yes. And that tracks their hit points. In this case, I've set up these tokens so that the green bar equals hit points. Okay. Uh, and that's hooked up to the digital character sheets. So, for example, on a left here. It's Let me a... jump in just quickly. Sure. Uh, Craig Campbell wanted to ask, does Roll20 support dice as well as cards? Like if we're playing Savage Worlds, can we use it? to do the card-based initiative and stuff? Uh, there's a way to do card decks in Roll20. Uh, I haven't used it much, but there is a deck function. Um, like here's a card deck I just threw down in the corner. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a generic card deck, but you can shuffle and deal. So I would imagine that... I haven't played in the Savage Worlds version on Roll20, but okay. uh, anything that they've implemented, people have figured out how to implement. Actually. Okay. So, so yes, so but I'm, we're not exactly sure. I how. would bet the answer is yes, because there's a lot of <laughs> Savage Worlds on Roll20. All right. So sorry to interrupt, but please continue. No, no, no. Interrupt as much as you want to. I, I love questions. <laughs> You're going to regret that later. <laughs> so, uh, um, so for example, uh, Wembley here, right? Yep. Uh, Indiana Jones. So this bar is his hit points. Indiana had, gnomes. Yeah, he's a half like <laughs> mini, uh, mini Indiana room? Jones. Mini, yeah. Yeah. there you. Yeah. Okay, now I'm with you. Yeah, he's an archaeologist uh, rogue. So he has 27 hit points. So if he got <clears throat> lost, let's say seven hit points. Okay, I could just retype his hit points as 20. Or if you don't want to do the math, and this is the major upshot of roll 20, it does math for you. I could just type minus seven in his hit points and it knocks it down. And so you can see that he's injured. Uh, yep. So right now it just shows like a space, like it's basically clear. Is there right. a way to put like a red so that it becomes red as it goes across like in a video well, game or? You, uh, don't, you don't really have a style option there. Okay. Um, you could code the tokens a little differently, so it's using a red bar instead, but it gotcha. would still just be the blank spot. Gotcha. You can also apply like condition effects. Maybe he's uh, restrained. Maybe he's asleep. Maybe he's busy dying. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you could put a red dot on him, and you can do that to anything, even monsters. 
So, so specifically like in fourth edition where you had a billion different conditions that you could apply to monsters or characters, you could do that. Right. The other thing you can do to mark characters is, uh, for example, you can add an aura to them. Like I just put an aura around Dare. Mm -hmm. I see that. So if you're fighting a bunch of monsters and you want one of them to look different, you want to say this is the caster or this guy looks extra tough or whatever. It's like an easy way to mark them without needing a new graphic. So Rule 20 gives you a lot of options that way. And uh, let's see. So this is the most basic interface. You have your character sheet, which I invite you to go look at. Let's suppose you're using Roll20 and you're okay. going to use the character sheets. All righty. Okay. Where would I go to see that? So see on the upper right, you have the little chat icon. Yep. Uh, and then there's this journal, like the yep. folded newspaper. Mm -hmm. If you go in there under characters, you're going to find Bishop. Yep. Okay. Let's, if I can really walk you through this. Um, and it gives you a little bio. Um, all these links go to handouts inside Roll20, uh, but you want to go to the Character Sheet tab. Okay, I'm there. And then within the Character Sheet tab, you see how right now you're on the core page? Yes. You also have bio and spells. Okay. Uh, and it's very homebrew friendly. As you can see, his spells are all like gnome tech variants of regular spells. Right. And you can just click a spell to cast it, for example. Basically, you click anything in here, and it'll it'll do the thing. So if you want to roll a save, you go to the saving throw section under core and click the name of the save. Or if you want to roll a dex check, you click the word dexterity. Okay. I just rolled a saving throw. Mm -hmm. Not sure how I did because I can't see it, but I'm sure we'll go back to it in a minute. Right. So... My, my my first question here is, this functionality is amazing. My concern is how long does it take to get here first? Like, how do you get used to it or how do you get well, set Well, just up? like inputting the information. Like, I mean, I fill out a character sheet with a piece, you know, paper and pencil. Sure. I can do that. But So like, how long is it going to take me to go in and do all of this to get so, it set up? So you could do it the hard way, which would be like typing in all the information or copying, pasting it from from your legal text source, which is certainly not an OCR PDF. No. And um, uh, from the OGL, let's say. You could do it that way. Or the way they have Roll20 set up is you've got, um, let's say you want to add a spell to your sheet. Okay. Right? So uh, a level three spell, okay? Okay. Or level two. Bless is level two, right? I don't so, know. Go to his spell tab. Okay, I'm there. And under two, hit the little plus. Okay. Mm and then you see next to the journal icon, there's the compendium, the little I. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. And type bless. Okay. Okay, well, hold on. Sure. I think I lost you there. So I clicked the little icon, but I don't right. see and where I a am. Search, then there's a search box. Mm. may just be the way my screens are set up. I don't see the search box, but it's probably there. Mm. Let me make sure you yeah. have access to it. Uh, yeah, I think it's just behind stuff. Uh, yeah, ah, there it is. Okay. okay. Yeah, there we go. Less. Okay. Okay. So Searching. you added a... You, you, under two on your sheet, you hit the plus and it gave you like a little blank form for a spell. Yep. You can drag that bless in there. Okay. And it will automatically add the spell. Ah, I see that. It'll say accepting drop from compendium. And then once it's in there, you can just click the name of the spell and cast it. At what level? Let's go seven or six because that's what I hit. Very yeah. fancy. Very fancy. All right. Okay. Yep. And there's all kinds of other things you can do, like to make that little D4 actually get rolled automatically. Um, uh, like, for example, the burning hands. I'm going to click your burning hands here. I'm going to cast okay. it at level one. 
and see how it automatically tells you your DC is 13 and the creature takes 12 fire damage in this case. So it just tells you quick. Okay, so outside of spells, but like just putting in, I have a 14 dexterity and that equals a plus two and that plus two is, goes on my save and throw and on acrobatics. Right. How does so, all that work? So go back to your core. Okay. And um, you put your stats in the little ovals, like just like you do on a paper sheet. Mm -hmm. And it automatically calculates your plus, which is the bigger number on top. Sure. And then it automatically uh, calculates everything else too. You just check off which ones are your skills. Okay. So change his dexterity to like 20. And then you'll see that all the numbers related to dexterity change. Gotcha. Okay, yeah. And similarly, when you level up, you just change your level at the top of this sheet, and the proficiency bonus changes, and all those numbers change. Okay. Now, is this all, like, free to anyone, or is this something you had to pay for to get access to this? This is, this is totally free. Okay. Um, I, I have a pro account, which wipes ads off all my games, um, including for my players. Oh, cool. So you guys just inherit that. Nice. Um, but uh, plenty of people play for free. It's great. Okay. All right. Very, very cool. You, like, they have a marketplace where you can buy graphics. You don't have to buy their graphics. You can load your own stuff in here. So, in fact, that's what I've done for a lot of this. And, uh, yeah, in that sense, it's, it's handy. I mean, it has a little learning curve, but there's a lot of tutorials right. out there, too. So, free accounts are free. Um, if you don't mind us asking, how much do you pay for your pro account? I don't remember. I really don't. Um, That's how they get you. There's, there's a middle grade also. Okay. I've got the pro account because it lets me run like, there's a, a really active user community that makes scripts that modify Roll20. So you can do like even more powerful things with it, like automatic ammo tracking or uh, pathfinding or there, there's just so many different things like timers, just, just lots of options with this uh, plug-in scripting function. Okay. Uh, but that's really high-level stuff, All right. which we won't be demonstrating today. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll be googling prices while you're doing the next thing, and then I'll let people know. Okay, sure. So you also have, um, I, I'm, you don't have to go look at it right now, but uh, on the core tab, also, uh, I'm just going to go over the different sections. Okay. So in the first column, you have all your stats and your skills. There's a little toggle for whether or not you have inspiration at the top here. And then below that, there's your passive, um, passive perception. Uh, you can enter whatever tools and languages you have. Then in the middle column, you get your armor class, um, which you can either enter manually or it gets automatically calculated from your stats and your inventory. Like, it's smart enough to do that. Okay. So if you drag armor into your inventory, it will try to give you the appropriate AC. Um, your bonus to initiative, uh, your speed, your hit points. Um, so you can adjust your hit points here, or you can adjust them on your token. Um, I think it's more reliable to adjust it on the token, because if you start doing it in both places, I think it might get out of sync. I'm not sure. Okay. Um. And then you can roll hit dice, you can roll death saves. Um, there's uh, all your weapon attacks in the next section. So if you want to shoot the crossbow, you just click crossbow. Um, and for all these dice rolls, by the way, if you hover in chat, like for example, the, the burning hands we just did, it said they take 12 fire damage. So. If you hover, you see, oh, that was 3d6, and you've got a 2, a 5, and a 5. Uh, similarly, in the roll we did above that con save, mm -hmm. it automatically rolled both a 6 and a 19, because I set my games to automatically always roll both, because then if you have advantage or disadvantage, you it's our, the number's already there. Okay. Yeah, but I remember... By default, um, you would take the first number. Yeah, right. Um, I know that one of the few times that we did use Roll20 back in the day, uh, 
that's what we would do is we just put them together. And then, you, I mean, you can right. do that math. If you roll a, a seven and a nine, it's both plus five. You can look to see which one you take. And yeah, yeah. That exactly. Yeah. Uh, oh. So my Google foo, foo failed me. I cannot figure out how much Roll20 costs. So if anybody in chat knows, please throw it in there. I got to the subscription page and it told me all about why I should get one, but it didn't show how much. At least I couldn't find it if it did. Yeah, it's not important. It's like I said, I'm somebody. Already will... in. I'm already in, so maybe I don't see the page anymore. Oh, uh, yeah, that could be it. So, okay. so let's see. Then below that, you've got your money and your inventory. Um, if you want it to add up the weight of your inventory, you can. Um, and then they basically have tried to make sure they lay this out just like the regular character sheet. So it's as easy as possible for people. Then you've got, you know, your traits, ideals, bonds, and flaws. Um, you can add however many class resources here. In his case, he's got second win and an action surge. Uh, and then there's this character features and traits section. Uh, so you can um, open these up to get details if you want by clicking the title. Or you can output it to um, to chat if you want by hitting the little talk icon. Like if you want to show people, hey, by the way, um, in his case, we've reskinned his second wind as if he's getting like a healing potion injected into his body. Uh, so, okay. so that's what we, uh, and then he, he can show it to the whole group. Um, you can also roll things so that only the GM can see. Okay. Like if I'm running a monster and I'm rolling, you, you guys won't see me rolling. Um, but I will. Can you also, I know you can send private messages to the DM, but can you send private messages to each other as well? The, like yep. the whisper feature? Yeah, it's slash W and then the person's name. It might be the RP. No, I think it is just yeah. RPG code. It's, it's, there's a, uh, I'm not sure how it works with the space in the person's name, but yeah, you can whisper messages to each other okay. through here. Uh, so someone jumped in that it's four ninety nine for the mid tier and nine ninety nine for pro. But if you do a year subscription, it looks like you get a little bit of a discount. Yep. And your players can gift you with a subscription. Oh, nice. Yeah. 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 Your DM a little love. <laughs> so that's the player sheet. Um, why don't I show you a show you a monster sheet? Okay. Let me give you control of a monster. Oh, no. Rawr, I'm a monster. <laughs> so you don't have to constantly open and close this sheet and go look it up again. If you double click his name at the very top of the sheet, it sort of minimizes it to a little box. Oh, I, 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 somehow I got to edit token. Oh. I think I'm on the wrong place. Like the very top bar of the character sheet window. If no, I was click... I was looking at the token. Oh, okay. If you double click where it says Bishop Kepler on the very top left. Yeah. Then it'll make it like a little grayed out. Yep, I see. Yeah. That. Okay, so let's pop open this orc, and because Rule Twenty is very handy, I can just drag an orc out onto the screen, just from the side here. So now we have an orc. So if I have a spontaneous encounter, I could say, oh, guess what? Uh, three orcs show up, right? And they all look the same. That's kind of boring. So I also have an option because I used multi-sided tokens to randomize them. Yeah, okay. So now my orcs all look different. And that's a, a core function to roll 20. If you want to add multiple images for a token, you can. Um, I've also done that for player tokens. Like they can have like a sort of a powered up form, for example. I gotcha. Now with those tokens, are these ones that you've purchased from the marketplace or did you input those yourself off of various I, art I places? Put, I put some in myself um, and others I've bought off the marketplace um, uh, because they clash so wonderfully. I have not added my own tokens to Roll20, but I could do that. Gotcha, gotcha. Yep. All righty. So... The orcs work the same way. Um, you can either open their character sheet from the journal page, 
or for any character, including you, that you control, you can just select the token and then you see it gets this little box around it. And then if you shift double click, it'll automatically open the sheet. Okay, I think I lost you there. Okay. Um, no hold problem. on, Some, those are questions. That's what got me distracted. Sure. Uh, so Dirty Habanero wanted to know if it does anything with languages. So like, for example, could you pick Orcish and type in, right. hi, my name is Frank, and only if the characters that speak Orcish, it would translate and they would see what they said and everyone else would see gibberish. Um, it doesn't do that by default, but I know there are people using the API script system who have worked on stuff like that. Okay. So, uh, but I haven't implemented anything like it. Okay. All right. So back to the character sheet. So again, I think okay. some, of, some of it's me not following directions very well. So I see three orcs. I it's, see our four it's, characters. It's easy for me. I'm used to it. I've got to make sure I explain <laughs> it in a way other people will understand. So it's all okay. good. So uh, you see how when you click a token that you control? Yeah. Um, I... It pops up this little, uh, you know, resize handles. Okay. Uh, so you can, uh, like, if they get knocked out, you can just change their their angle for example uh so when you're in there and you've got it selected you can either move it around mm -hmm. see, or you can double click it you can hold down shift and double click it and that automatically opens the character sheet okay yep now i got you so the orc is the same way it has the bio tab the character sheet tab and the attributes and abilities tab uh, by the way, that attributes and abilities, that's kind of the nuts and bolts of the system. You don't want to edit that directly. Okay. Everything you want to edit is on the character sheet page. So uh, remember how I said you could manually enter all your spells or you can pull it out of the compendium? Yeah. You can pull monsters out of the compendium too. Okay. Everything that's in the OGL, you can get out of the compendium. Um, the downside is that the OGL monsters don't have tokens built in. Okay. But if you buy the monster manual from Roll20, it's all coded already with tokens. Okay. Or you can upload your own tokens like I did and then link them up with monster sheets. Okay. So, it, so which it's is, the, it's, you know, it's a the little... time versus money, how much you're willing to spend time versus how right. much you're willing to spend money. Right. And it's a little overhead, but when you think about like how many times I'm going to have to have an orc, you know, roll an attack, being able to just click it is super handy. Gotcha. So, um, and that tells you, you know, it's your monster man manual entry and you can do everything you need to do about the orc. So, so if I wanted to the orc to roll an attack, I would just click on great axe. Sure. Go. Oh, that's, that's the, so see how that six came up red. Uh, no, it's probably behind my character in, sheet again. In chat? Let me get back to chat. Okay. Uh, uh, yes. So if you hover over, you see, oh, it's because I rolled a one. Ooh, okay. So red means you rolled a one or, or whatever the lowest value is. Green means you rolled a 20 or whatever the highest value is for that particular die. Okay. So if you're not using the digital the 3D dice, it's another quick indicator of, ooh, ooh, I critted. Yeah. This Yikes. is awesome. Yeah. So, um, and you can hover over anything to see how it, how it did the math okay. for you. So those are the basics of the character sheet interface. Um, if you have any questions about that, oh, there's also like initiative that you can go through. Um, I can demo that if you want. So, so does the system do it for you? Like everyone clicks their initiative and then it populates the turn order? Yeah. Once the turn order I, thing is up, you grab your own token so that it knows which token to use. And then you click initiative on your sheet. So, and you can roll it. If you're the GM, you can roll it for, you know, other people. Roll it for this orc. All right. So I'm failing here. Okay. So I so, clicked on my token. Right. Uh, you but I didn't get token, to the yep, I didn't get to the character sheet. In your sheet, which you can get again with shift double click if you need to. So it's bringing up like these little circles. Like I have a 35 in red, a 36 in green. 
Right. But so I'm not getting to the character. That's your theory. movement speed, your hit points, and your AC. Okay. Which is handy to have there because you can like basically run the game without even opening a monster character sheet if if you if like those are the numbers you need the most often, right? Right. Okay. It's also handy for the DM because then you can be like, oh, this attack hits you, and I know that because your AC is right here. All right. So I got there eventually. Okay. Uh, so I got a 13 on my initiative, but it didn't populate into your turn order. It didn't order. come in. Uh, you must have dropped the token somehow. But because I'm the GM, I can actually add you. So you can add manual things here. So, for example, I can do round one. And then my round calculation will be plus one. Right? So now that, let's say this is everybody that's in the initiative, right? Oh, there okay. you go. Yeah, Much people better. in chat are helping me out because I don't know what go. I'm doing. All Got right. It. So these are, so obviously these are out of order. And then you can hit the little, or I can hit the little gear and say, okay, I want this in descending order. Right? Yep. So you're first. Ha ha. And if you're not sure who's who, you can actually just hover over the turn order and it'll highlight the things taking turns. Ah, okay. And I think it lets you do that also. Uh, yes, I'm seeing so that. I can say, okay, Bishop, it's your turn. I'm going to stab him in the face. Stab him in the face. Classic. It's it's the move. Yeah, it is. You know? I actually think that should have been what d d was called. I want to play I Stab Him in the Face. There you go. <laughs> How do you want to stab this? Uh, well, it actually looks like I have a like a hand crossbow. According to, so can I just yep. point blank that into someone's eye? You can. It's built into your arm. Nice. Shoot shoot somebody. Yes, that's what I want to do. Okay. Tell me which one you're shooting. Uh, I'll hit the orc on the left, the one that has the All right. more Great. white background. So how do I do that? So just click the words hand crossbow. Uh, ba, ba, ba. Gotta get to my character sheet. Uh, I see main crossbow, bonus crossbow. Yep, he's got a crossbow with both arms. Oh, all right, I'll do main he's crossbow. He's crossbows all the way down. Alrighty. All right, I got 13 to hit, which uh, meets the AC of this orc. For seven piercing damage. Right. Nice. So then I take off that. And then, um, aw, I have a little API script that is supposed to show a little red dot on anything that's been bloodied, like it's half yeah. down. Yep. Um, but I don't, I don't see it. it. I don't have it running right now. I'm super sad. Gotcha. So that is one thing I see right away is that, you know, from like a metagame standpoint, you could see how hurt things are with this. Right. So well, can you hide that if you want? See, you can see it because I gave you control of the orcs. Ah, okay, okay. But if you're a player, or I whip out something you don't control, like uh, an Orox, okay? Like they have an Orox with them, right? Yep. You can't see his hit points, right? Right. There you go. Oh, so you can. So as the GM, you can kind of bird's right. eye view mm -hmm. where everybody's at. Okay, that makes sense. Right. I can also like make things invisible and just move them around. You don't know where they are, but I do. You can oh, do nice. all kinds of stuff like that. So then uh, the initiative, or the turn order, I can just cycle through the turn order. And then notice I get to rounds done and it counts it. Okay. Cycle through, there's round two, et cetera. You can also use um, auto calculating entries like this spell lasts nine rounds or this effect lasts five rounds. You can, you can add stuff like that. So hand yeah i can see that okay so i'm going to close the turn order um we've gone over some of the basic functions of roll 20 just so you you know that once you get used to it that having your your character sheet there is really handy sure you don't have to do the math um, um now remember you could still be using this interface but be using a paper character sheet mm -hmm. or be or or your players could be using the digital character sheets but you're still using the monster manual or you're running some homebrew monster 
and making it up as you go along, or you adjust the hit points. <laughs> no one or, does that. No, no, no. No one ever. It's by the rules, yes, by the book. Yes. Nobody ever balances an encounter on the fly <laughs> to make it more fun. Yeah. Nope. You nope. can do that in Roll22. That's, That's my right. point. Not that anyone would dream of ever doing such a thing. No, blasphemy. Right, exactly. So, uh, yeah. Uh, so I used this screen as an example of just a really minimal theater of the mind. You could run your whole campaign theater of the mind just from this screen. Okay. Right? Yep. If you wanted to, you could even use it as a loose map. Like you could say, okay, uh, Bishop's fighting two orcs. This one runs over to Aleph. And uh, Dare, what do you want to do? And she says she wants to go help Bishop, right? So that doesn't have to be their literal positions. It's yeah. just sort of where we're... And you still give your evocative theater of the mind description, you know? Uh, so this would qualify as the loose map idea. Mm -hmm. Or you could use the drawing tool in Roll20 and be like, yeah, here's the road. And there's some bushes. Okay. And here's a... Here's a a dead guy in the road. Eh. <laughs> you know, like you could do stuff like that too if you wanted. So if you want to draw a quick phallic looking maps, you can yeah. with Roll20. Yeah, that's a thing that happens sometimes. Yep. Always actually, yeah. <laughs> More yeah. often than not, I should say. Yep. So uh, if if you find one of your players can't resist drawing uh, on the map, you can like banish them to another page. <laughs> so you can split the party across multiple pages. Uh, so speaking of pages, let me show you a new page. Okay. So now I'm going to show you the different options for visuals in Roll20. Okay. Um, I've shown you that you can have different tokens and different types of tokens for the same monster and all that good stuff. So here is a fancier through theater of the mind setup. And you may have to zoom out so you can see this a little better. So this is something I bought off the Roll20 Marketplace because it was pretty. Okay, I see it now. So um, here I have like bigger versions of the character tokens. So I'm using them more like portraits and they're just sitting off to the side. So their position is not important. Right. And then um, for this, uh, you know, fancy backdrop i can say like you've got the sun up or maybe it's like sunset maybe it's it's so you can see how the wheel is moving right yes you know so you've got options and uh again you could just use this and just do descriptions for everything or you could use this and also say you know and you're talking to king melandrock here he is Right? Yep. Um, or you can, uh, let's see. Or you can, again, set up impromptu encounters just using this sort of staging area, like a loose map, to show who's engaged with what. So, so you can see how many enemies there are. Okay, so sorry, sorry, a couple questions. So sure. like when we were on the last screen, you were able to bring in the orcs, and then you obviously you made three really quick, and then you grabbed the other creature. Did you have those ready? Like, or, or like, like, are your minis set aside, or did you just grab that from the OGL? I, I literally grabbed it from my journal tab. Like, uh, let's have a Eye of Grumsh here and a uh, Red Fang because I also bought Volo's Guide and uh, another Arox and uh, how about a Silver Dragon? Let's be really weird. And let's all have a big fight. Now it's a party. Yeah. And so you can have like a completely unplanned encounter um, if you've got your monsters ready. Okay. So, so what do you mean you by can, what do you mean by ready as far as like just having the tokens attached? Like if you've got them in your journal. Okay. Or you've got the monster manual purchased, or you know, you can either get it from purchased assets, you can build them using the OGL. Or you can manually add information. Okay. So, so, so once you've done it once, like you have five campaigns, I make orcs once. I always have orcs. Um, what you have in any given campaign depends on what you've imported there. Okay. Um, one upshot of a pro account, and this is actually the main reason I have a pro account, 
is that you can copy stuff from one campaign to another. Okay. So what I have is I have a workshop campaign and that's where I keep the master untainted, untouched, no combat has happened. Everything is covered up by fog of war versions of all my maps, for example. Okay. Uh, I have, you know, like a forest path. I have a, a ship. I have like all the things I imagine I might need. Um, and then, um, and you can set up encounters there ahead of time if you want also. Um, and I also have copies of all of my monsters and everything. Okay. So I, if I'm starting a new campaign, I can copy my workshop to become the new campaign. Or with the pro subscription, you can copy stuff back and forth. Okay. So I could build it in my workshop and then deploy it to the three games I'm running. Got it. For example. Or if they go to revisit a place that I didn't think they'd go back to. Because uh, that never happens. Yeah, that never happens. Uh, I can either pull it out of the archive in their campaign, or I can pull it out of my workshop if I okay. need a fresh copy. Gotcha. Um, but let's say they left the village in flames, right? Because that never uh, happens. Because that never <laughs> happens. You, you, you can pull your local copy of the map, which would probably still have fire all over it. So <laughs> Nice. Now, that's one of the things that I did just briefly use back again, back in the day when we started using Roll20, was just for like sort of ambiance. Like I would have a picture of a swamp mm -hmm. that I would just throw up the picture rather than ah. trying to describe the swamp. I'd be like, here's so a swamp. Here's where we get to, and I'm going to take you to the next page, which is the same theater of the mind, but with a picture for ambiance. Ah, there we go. So you see, this is like a creepy forest with the ancient ruined and etched stones um and another handy trick is if you hit sh if you're the gm and you select something and you hit shift z okay it'll pop it up to show the players larger okay and then they can just click away so question for you yep is it possible to do something here like with layers where there's mm -hmm. two versions of this picture but one of them has like a ghostly image of a lady and yes. so you have it been like, oh, wow, there's a ghost. Yeah, let's let's do that. Where's my. Uh... Where is she? Sahara. I have Lady Sahara from Sahara Guard. And here she is. So I didn't know we were doing a ghost encounter until just now. But there she is. <gasps> <gasps> right. So having resources handy is very convenient. Yes. And here she is, the ghostly image of Lady Sahara. So, yep, exactly. <laughs> Stab her in the face. They put her up there. <laughs> so, um, you can also stack things here. So, if you have like a series of scenes, you know you're probably going to want to show them in a night. Like, there's the ghostly forest, and here's an orc encampment. And here's the beautiful port city that you just visited. And just like any theater of the mind game, you can still give your description. and um, But then this can sort of help give you a little more to set the scene. More visual. So uh, back to my other question is, where do all these images come from? Did you go search the I, web and find them? I took them off the web. And, okay. And I'd like but to since... think that they're fair use because I'm educating people right now. <laughs> well, I think in your home game they should be. I don't I don't exactly right. know how it works with us, but I wouldn't I wouldn't uh I wouldn't do this for a uh, public game unless there are things you there's lots of things you can buy off Roll20. Mm -hmm. Um you can also look for images from the Creative Commons, for example. Um you can look for public domain images. Um remember it doesn't have to just be fantasy art. You can even use like photos of woodland scenes or of ruins or and a lot of those have been released under um creative commons or public domain uh so there are ways to do this legally sure and again i don't think it's illegal for you to use it in right. your private home game yeah that's personal use and again would fall under fair use yeah and what i'm doing right now i'm educating you so technically so let's say you're investigating somebody's desk right? Got it. Yep. You could use something like this. And it may be, and this is what I love about using photos, uh, that your players pick up on something that they find really interesting, but you weren't thinking about, and you can just roll with it. Um, 
I had a, a map that had this like giant green statue in the background. And uh, one of the players took a real interest in this. And so I spun out this whole line of like 100% canon because I'm the DM. Yep. About how this was like a giant st- ancient looking statue made of adventurine, which is a green crystal that mages use uh, to channel magical energy. And so the character decided that she wanted to steal this giant multi-story statue As and it do. turned into like a side plot that triggered a little bit of a disaster <laughs> but the point is it's like it wouldn't have happened if we hadn't had the photo there right so or or they'll use the terrain it, it, it can show them like it gives them a better sense of height but but we'll get to that on one of the next screens okay so yeah i just i have a bunch of different scenes in here just to give you the idea um the cool thing about things like this is that you can also um let's see i'm going to move these tokens to the token layer so uh for example uh in this uh you know meeting room scene you can pull in your pcs and your npcs and just it's just like another way of showing them what's going on mm-hmm. right and then maybe combat breaks out and you use this like a map like you've got you've got a lot of options so you can sort of there's sort of a continuum between showing a scene just to be evocative and sh- turning a scene into something else so like this is a scene of the theater but it could easily become a fight scene with oh, yeah. height with height as a factor right Mm -hmm. and there's cover like it it wouldn't be hard to run uh so you get the idea yes so one of the things i like to do and that's what i'm going to show you on the next scene uh the next page is um i like using these scenes as maps um so like i said for example here's a shop that they're visiting right and um i've I could just show the shop or I could get all the people and they could be, you know, wandering through the shop. They could be talking to the shopkeep here, right? Guard. He has stats just in case we need it. Yeah. So, so, uh, that's why I especially like scenes that kind of give you an isometric view. Mm -hmm. Um, you can also do stacked up, like I showed you, you could do stacked up maps. Um, and so these are the scenes that I use, like when they visit Mother Taflorns in Waterdeep, for example. So here's the outside. Here's the fancy entryway. The reception desk. You know, you could just use stuff like that. I don't have a map of the place, but they get the idea. Gotcha. Yeah, I, I see. So, okay. Uh, so then beyond scenes, of course, you can have like an isometric and or top-down map. Uh, this is the aftermath of them attacking an orc encampment the other day, since I just copied this from my real game. Okay. Uh, so you see a whole lot of dead orcs as a result. Um, I don't currently. Don't. No. You're not on the forest clearing. You I might have see... to. You might have to slide around or zoom in and out. Okay. They're kind of on the lower, lower right. This is a larger ah, map. Ah, okay. This is there a larger map than the ones I've been showing you. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Now I see a bunch of dead orcs. Yep. Terrible thing. Oh no! Those orcs were just trying to get along, you know. This was where my players discovered that orcs get that bonus dash and were suitably horrified. It was lovely. <laughs> so um, then I've got another even larger map here for you. So it's like a village view, which again, you could use for like a larger scare battle or just for them to go shopping or whatever. Now, uh, let's say you buy a module, uh, right. Storm King's Thunder, Ravenloft, mm-hmm. and a lot of times those will come with ambient maps or right. or combat maps. Are those all part of the deal that you then have access to? Uh, yeah, uh, 
I've I've bought a few. Um, I could have demoed one of those. What am I thinking? Because I do <laughs> legally, I, I did buy it, uh, but it wouldn't have had all the examples I wanted. Uh, yes, it comes with the maps already set up. It comes with the monsters already statted with tokens. Like it's got everything you need. Now, That's is the it the idea. same price as buying the book off the shelf or is it a different um, price? Do you know, I, I don't remember how they compare. I don't think it's more. I think one of them is like 20 to 40 dollars. Okay. And again, I mean, it does mean you're probably buying it twice. Twice. But, right. But the if you want to buy just the Roll20 version, all the text is available to the DM. Um, because they'll give you handouts with all the information, like chapter one, chapter two. Um, or like if there's, and I say handout because it can also be a handout that you literally give the players so they can see it. Like if you go into the journal, you see there's a character section, but below that there's handouts. Yep. And you should be able to see this bracelet. So there's an image of the bracelet and then below that some text. Uh, I see assembly list factions. Oh, you see a bunch maps. of stuff. Yeah. Okay. Uh, below the assembly list is bracelet drawing. I have castle nair tier maps and then Cormier <sighs> maps. And then well, Cormier anyway, ranks. you can open any one of those. Is the I trust. Right? I trust you. Okay, okay. I opened up as yeah. yeah trust I'm me. With you. Trust me. So, so um, that's another way you can share things with your players. It can be a visual or text or both. Gotcha. And again, you can share that to just certain players, like if it's a secret note, or right. again, if it's written in Orcish and only some people read Orc, you could give mm -hmm. them the translated right. version. You can those give people. just those people. Yeah. Gotcha. Exactly. You can have two different versions of the note, like here's the note with the secret code. And then after they translate the secret code, you give them access to the, you know, decoded note. Okay. Stuff like that. Or progressively more revealed versions of a map that they actually have in their possession or a map that they're drawing. Mm -hmm. So I've, uh, you, you get the gist of how you could slide around on a grid here yeah, and run a fight. So now we're going to start talking about ambient lighting. So I'm going to drag you to a big black screen. Ooh, scary. Uh, so if you slide around, Oh wait, I've got to put Bishop on this screen or you won't be able to see anything. I see like a four square altar looking roomy thing. Oh, now it's lit up. Yeah, there he is. Because uh, you, you can only see what your character sees. Ha, there we go. So here he is in the middle of this like sewer grate. Okay. Mm -hmm. So in my game, this was the dungeon below Hellgate Keep. So this is all hidden. Um, and I can like reveal an area in whatever direction you end up going. So where would uh, you like to go, Michael? Uh, well, I usually go lucky left, but I don't know which, because there's four entrances. So let's go bottom sort of right. I'll okay. assume that's left if I was facing sure. that so way. So I'm using a square tool that lets you uncover things, but there's also a polygon reveal. So I think I'll use that. So it's a long hallway doorway on the side all right so my screen has stopped i saw and the there we go a bunch of imps oh, ah! and okay. now i have a yep so you've got a lot of options for just revealing things gradually on this page i'm not using dynamic lighting um but uh you could really combine this dynamic lighting with now you notice this is an isometric map mm -hmm. so it's not gonna um distances are going to get kind of funny on the diagonals but it'll still work it'll this is the same as like a loose map except it looks nice yeah. so i just uncovered another area on the lower left where there's like an evil summoning circle well, you know evil evil subjective it's a summoning yeah, exactly. circle it's a summoning circle i'm sure nothing's yeah. wrong right. the summoning circle isn't evil whoever uses it could yes. be evil the 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 megaloths and mesoloths are probably not a problem so they're just yeah. misunderstood yeah yeah exactly so uh and then i can just reveal the whole map so and they could slowly work their way through this and then find everything 
Now, when you set this up, is there the default that you have the map, then you add like the darkness cover and then there's another tool to reveal Mm -hmm. or do you, or, or, so any map could be done like this. Right. Okay. How easy is it to do that? Like, is that like a lot of extra time or is it pretty quick? So when you're setting up the map, uh, you first, you size it to how you want in relation to the grid. Uh, then you, um, will tell it, okay, enable fog of war. Okay. And then it paints the whole thing over with black. Uh, you're the GM, so it's not opaque to you. Or actually, you can set how opaque, opaque it is or isn't to you. Okay. Um, but to the players, it'll be opaque. Uh, and then you can, if if a certain area of the map should start out uncovered, you can just go ahead and select that area, just like the starting area that you landed in there. So that's the other reason I like having my workshop campaign. Like, now that I've uncovered this map, it would kind of be a pain to recover it again, but then I right. just go grab another copy. So then as my final example, I pull it all together by taking you to the hatchery from Horde of the Dragon Queen. Yeah, it looks like... Yep. Oh, there we Put him in the entryway. And because I'm a jerk, I'm taking his dark vision away. Uh, all right. I'm going crazy with this size thing here. I'm yeah, probably... this is an even bigger map. You're mm. on the middle left of the map. Actually, yeah. I can make you go there. There I you go. Kind of found myself. Okay. Yep. As a DM, I can like pull people's attention to a particular point. Okay. So here's your map. I believe. Do you see the light like fading as it goes into the cave? Uh, there's like a hard stop on the left. There's like a red line. So I don't know if there's a wall there that I just can't see because I can't see all of it. And then it looks, so it looks pretty even. I don't, I don't think it's sti- dynamic. See any lighting? Oh. Huh. All right. Well, Let me let me reveal another area of the cave and put sure. her in there, and then we'll see if that works. Yeah, no problem. If it works because it should be running. And it looks like we've had a couple more people jump jump in. So once again, uh, if you have any questions, uh, please let me know. I'll I'll try to parse them out to Jen when we have a moment. Uh, but yeah, all right. So so are you getting any um like? Okay. Wall, yeah. Are the uh, walls opaque to you, for example? Uh, when you moved my like di- orientation, the the light moved. Yeah. So now, like. Yeah. Yeah. So, so like, now I have dynamic lighting. Okay. So, like the cultist ah. hiding behind the pillar, you can only see it from certain angles. For example. Uh. Now, so what see, would happen? Ah, I just disappeared. Is it is it getting dark down there? Uh, well, I apparently I moved myself somewhere like in a cove, and then like the whole screen went dark. So let's say we had four characters down here. Right. Would I still only see what I see, or would I Each see what of everyone them sees? Sees their own thing. Oh. So um, you've got this lantern now. Is this is this dark back here, or is it? Does it depend where the lantern is? I think it depends where the lantern is. Someone in chat said that I think I have two vision points, which might be part of the confusion. I don't really even know what that means. That I, I, it means that you might have more than one character assigned to you. Oh. Let me, let me. Um... Yeah, I can see the, like the solid dark where I can't see and then the darker areas and the, the brighter light where the lantern is. So I can see that sort of. Uh, someone said maybe the orc. I might still have access to that. Yeah, but there aren't any orcs here. As far I'm as gonna, you know. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to actually uh, turn myself into a player for a minute. Okay. So Make the transition. and It's, it's going to reload my screen. And it might reload yours too.
so dark. A dorky, dorky, dork. Oh, no, I can't see anything at all. Oh, wait, there it is. Ah, uh, okay. That dark vision. So, do you see the light fading out as it goes further and further away t into these mushrooms? Um, well, it's weird. Like, there, there's a really bright band of light. Mm -hmm. And just to either side of it, it's a little bit darker. But it's it's right next to me. So, it's not like it fades out in the darkness. It just fades out right outside my direct line of sight. Right. And then if there's like there's like a pillar, it's solid black on the other side of it because I can't right. see through because it. Because you can't see past it. Darker. Lantern is further away. Yeah, well, okay, I'm, I am seeing it now. Because I moved the lantern back out to the entrance. Yeah. So it's getting darker and darker where you are. Right. So there's like actually getting solid black and then dark solid black kind of dark so yeah so it's like okay. uh, the darkness is so, creeping up on me so yeah it, it basically the thing about dynamic lighting is that not only can you have that kind of effect for like ambiance and so what people see is what they actually see like there's a secret room down here but you only see it once you come around this corner tunnel down here so it looks like there's two lanterns. So I don't know if maybe that was what the problem was. Yeah, maybe it's just too bright back here. Okay. Uh, but that's that's an example of what it can do. If you do have dark vision, you can see a lot further. Um, I've got it. Anybody with dark vision can see, you know, whatever it is, 60 feet as if it's bright light. Mm -hmm. And then it's dim light past that. Uh, just so they can see where the edge of their vision is. Okay. Uh, so that's the basic idea. And you can explore your... And let me go back to being a GM. I can uncover this. And then you can explore as much of this as you want to. And I'll set it so that you can control the lantern and drag it along with you. Yay. <laughs> the other thing I could do is I could actually make you a light source as if you're carrying a lantern. That would be cool. So let me go ahead and do that. Open your token. I'm going to say it's a fairly dim one. 1530, and I'm going to say all players see light. And then I'm going to take the other lantern away. So there's your lantern. How's that look? Okay, yeah, I, I just went down. So there's a little bit of a delay, it looks like, which I yeah, mean, you're down with the internet. It updates only when you drop your token. Gotcha, okay. Um, you have an option to make that smoother for people by not using update on drop. But then I've heard stories about certain players who maybe just pick up their token and go cruising through the whole dungeon without dropping it, and then no uh. one knows that they did it. So, damn yeah. dirty cheaters. That's part of why I use the combination of fog of war and the uh, and the dynamic lighting. Gotcha. Okay. So yeah, I've, I've kind of figured out at least this seems to be a little bit easier for me to understand what's happening as I walk into rooms. The entire room is illuminated when I'm walking through hallways. Right. I lose sight of the rooms and just mm -hmm. have the hallway. So. Yep. And meanwhile, if I were still that other character, I wouldn't be able to see where you are at all now one thing we haven't touched on yet and i, I don't know how much more you had left to go was sounds ah, so like we yes. could play a, a little well, this is this is basically everything i was planning to show you guys for visuals so here we are in the spooky cave so let's let's get a little ambiance there we go hear my cave ambiance I can. I don't know if the audience will be able to. Yeah, I don't know about that. I, I, so if, if, if anyone's watching, let us know if you can now hear that. It sounds like we're in a cave with chittering bats, I think, and water dripping. Yep. Yep, yep, they can. Yay, oh, technology. And then, now, then if this isn't ominous enough for you, let's lay in some like music. 
How about that? Okay. Do you know what my next question is going to be? Yes. Sound effects? Well, no, 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 no. No. Before no. that. Okay. W where do we get the music from? Did ah. we have to buy it or? So, so because I'm um, a pro member, I've got uh, there's a library of sounds that you can use. And there's tabletop audio, battle bards, Incompetech. And you've got a lot of options there. Now, I believe you can also add your own sound. But I'm not sure how, because I've never done that before. <laughs> Sorry. It's all right. So then I've got that overlaid. OK. And let's say you uh, suddenly shoot your crossbow at something. I could do that, too. OK. Right. So uh, high level here. Would you be able to do something so that only certain characters hear things? Uh, I think it's all or nothing. OK, because that uh, would be really cool if you could have like one character going, I hear something and no one else actually hears it. That would be cool. That would be but cool. But it, it doesn't, I don't see a way to do that. You can okay. individually control the volume on your tracks. Like if this cave is just too loud, I can turn it way down. Okay. Oh, there's a couple of drakes. Hey guys, just passing through. Nothing to worry about here. Yeah. Bye. Welcome to Horde of the Dragon Queen. <laughs> nice. So a couple of people are mentioning Battle Bards. Uh, yes, Battle Bards is awesome. They've been a sponsor of ours several times in the past, and uh, it's it's awesome to see that they are integrated with this. Oh yeah, spoiler! Someone said so. If, uh, don't oh, don't, this don't, is a spoiler. Let's go to the other page. Yeah, don't look if you don't know. <laughs> no, no looking. No looking. <laughs> I'm sorry. The, uh, there's no statute of limitations. This was uh, three years ago, but yeah, it's right. going to yeah. be fresh to somebody. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, that. Those okay. fit, so basically, hopefully you can see how you can get like this whole spectrum of how you can have theater of the mind, theater of the mind with like a visual to like a scene. And then depending on the angle of the scene or just how you use it, you could use it as just like a stylish backdrop for just showing who's engaged with who. Or you could just line them up so you know how many there are. Right. On up to actually using the backdrop like an isometric map. Or you can actually get an isometric map or or on up to just like a standard top down grid. Um the other thing which I didn't even get into here because I don't use it often is um you can get pieces to use on a map. Like you could have a grassy field and then put down trees on it. Or you can have a like a cave tile set that lets you build your own cave map. And then you could put like a chest graphic down or a bedroll. Okay. Or So you can really build your maps up from scratch if you want. Um, I find that that gets a little, a little unwieldy in the interface, uh, but you've always got options. Like, like for example, in that orc camp map that I did, mm -hmm. like I had that forest layer, but then I added their tents and the campfire. And okay. I just I just added those in roll twenty. I just just said uh, tent for my tent, right? And then I can add that tent and uh, you know resize it to be however I want. So, what this always seems to come back to me on is. How much time does it take? It, it seems right. like I know there's a learning curve. So oh, if I if I tried to do it today, it would be a disaster. But you probably could go through it much quicker. But right. so you do this a lot. So clearly mm -hmm. you find value in it. Like you oh, you absolutely. think this adds to the game. Yeah. Do you do you think you prep any more than you would otherwise, or is it just different because you're doing it through the system versus like I use I, note cards? I honestly and such. think it's just different. Um, it's it's. And of course, you can prep as much or as little as you need to. Um, I like the spontaneity. See, what I really like, in terms of saving time, the biggest time savings is not on the prep front. It's during the game. Because you don't have players going, and what do I add to that? Let me do my math now. Uh, <laughs> plus uh, seven. Oh, and I also have to add this other thing. 
did I remember? None of that is happening because they right. click it and there's the answer. Right. Right. Because that so, does happen a lot. It's like, oh, wait, I forgot to add my plus two. Mm-hmm, so I mm-hmm. would have hit last turn. Yeah. Well, too bad. I mean, people still forget stuff, but, but in an, in, and you can even like back scroll to be like, wait, what level did you cast that at? Or mm-hmm. that, that's handy too. Uh, but as a DM, it's a lifesaver because um, even if you were using average damage, as Mike Shea recommends, um, let's say you were doing that to save time, you'd still be rolling their attacks. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and running the monsters off of these electronic sheets is so fast. It makes a huge difference in the efficiency of the game, as far as I'm concerned. Okay. Uh, and you can, of course, still give your evocative descriptions of how the attacks go and, you know, all that. And it, I think it actually frees up brain space for my players to, um, you know, do more to describe what they're doing in a cool way because they're not busy, like, calculating and I don't have to like flip through the monster manual to check that AC again. Mm-hmm. So in that sense, I find it super handy. Or they say they're casting a spell or how does this work? And then I can just go look in the compendium and be looking at the same spell. Instead of flipping to the page in the player's handbook, I can say bless. Okay. Where is bless? Here it is. And I can just look at it. Uh, attack roll or a saving throw. Okay, there's the answer. So... It's it's really handy to me in that regard as okay. well. So now when you use this for your home games, are you guys in the same room and there's like a TV on the wall that everyone's um, looking at? I have run it that way before. Um, it's if you're showing them your GM view, they're going to see you like rolling monsters and stuff. Yeah. Uh, but there's other ways to run that too. Um, usually when I run at home, I'm on the, my computer my husband's over there on his computer. My brother is over on his computer. And then my other two players are in other parts of the country. Gotcha. Okay. So, but even if I were running a game just for the guys in my house, I would run it on here. Okay. Just because it's easier for me. I mean, again, I can see once you've mastered it and once right. you have everything loaded, right. I, I just, again, and th- maybe it's just me that I'm like, you know, a technophobe that I would be like, oh, it's going to take so long to get there. But, you know, it's like climbing a mountain. You climb to the top and then you get the view, right. but it takes effort to get there. Yep. Uh, we've had a few more people jump on as well. So Great. once again, I'll throw it up. I think we're kind of near the end. So does yep. anybody have any questions for Jen or for myself or anything else you would like to see her cover? Uh, there's a little bit of delay, so I'll let that catch up. So while we're waiting, Jen, where can people find more of your work on the Internet? So I've been drawing uh, grinning, toothy, cartoony Extremely bright colored monsters. Yeah, can you on, throw up an example? On, uh, yes, I can. Uh, Dirty Habanero says that he has one computer running two instances, uh, one for GM and one for player, so they can, I guess they, everyone can see the player, but he can still. Perfect. Yeah. My buddy. <laughs> I am dumpy, derpy, happy basilisk. So, and you've been doing these for quite a while. Anybody who goes uh, to your Twitter, which is at Pixelscapes, you have links and examples and you do videos where you draw them and people can watch and that kind of thing. And now, do you also sell these for people in Roll20? Like if I wanted to Um, use your monsters, could I? I don't have packs in Roll20 yet, um, but I am planning to start that. Originally, I was distributing tokens through my Patreon. Um, but I actually shut my Patreon down uh, yeah. in, for reasons that came up recently. Right. Um, for reasons. Yeah. Reasons. Yeah. Uh, but it's actually a good move for me because it frees me up. I can do more commissions and probably make more money that way. All right. So, so once again, where, where can people find your work then? So um, my website is pixelscapes.com. And uh, I'm most active in the RPG community on Twitter at Pixelscapes. Um, I also have a Facebook page. I put my painting videos on YouTube. You can find all that through my website. Okay. So uh, definitely do stop by and say. All right. Fantastic. Thank you so much for doing this. I really, really appreciate it. We've had quite a few people jump on and been chatting back and forth with each other. So I this is a very visual episode. I probably will go back and add a little tag at the beginning because uh, this will get released as an audio only, but I don't know how much value that will have. Yeah, uh, I know but, about that. 
Yeah, but this will be on our Twitch channel for like four days, but it'll be on YouTube forever. So I'll go make the YouTube version public here in a little bit. Um, so hopefully anyone else who's out there who's interested might stumble upon our video and it will help them get things going. Um, so as for myself, again, Michael at the RPG Academy, you can find me pretty much anywhere you put in the RPG Academy and something comes up, it's probably me. Uh, I also will be at a bunch of conventions, uh, CincyCon, Sin City Con, Lexicon, Gen Con, and Origins are all in the future, plus our, our uh, faculty retreat, which is, you know, on the DL, not everybody gets to go to that. Uh, and unfortunately, we cannot yet make any official announcements about a Catacon. We're, we're close to being able to make some announcements, but we're not there yet. You, you can say it's a con, and it's amazing, and I love it. How yes. about that? Yep, there you go. That yeah. Fantastic. So if you haven't heard of a can and you should be there this year, right? So if you want to come yes. meet Jen in person, uh, yes. come to a catacomb. Absolutely. All right. So a couple people mentioned that they love your monsters. So that's awesome. So thank uh, you. Uh, one more time around the horn. Anybody have any questions for Jen or myself? Uh, so we'll just wait a, a minute or so to catch up on that. And of course, uh, if any of you think of anything later, just drop me a line on Twitter and I will let you know. Yep. I will say some oh, sure. other little tricks that I use for Roll20 is, yeah. you know how I can pop up images here? Mm -hmm. So um, I try. I like to upload my, my tokens extra large so that when I pop them up to view, that you can, um, you know, see them at a nice size. Gotcha. Uh, and that's the same reason I make my, my monsters size just because when it's that monster's turn you get a good view of it ah. uh so dirty have an arrow asked and i actually did miss it earlier oh. uh, ha have you ever used fantasy grounds and if so how would you compare the two uh i have not used fantasy grounds um i i it's tough for me to do a comparison i mean i've read some comparison articles um it sounds like Fantasy Grounds has had some strong points in terms of it having more mechanics built in for some things. Okay. But then again, I'm not sure. Like, as I understand it, Fantasy Grounds lets you say, you know, Monster A attacks Player B and then automatically applies the damage instead of having to subtract it. Mm -hmm. Like things like that, or the player can attack a particular monster. So there's a little more, even more automation there. Um, but I, I'm not sure I would actually use that because what if there's something else going on? What if there's an evil altar in the room that is changing the scenario? What if, what if, uh, there's a condition or terrain issue? Like, like I want to have a little more control than that personally. Right. Um, I'm sure it's optional in fantasy grounds, but but yeah, I mean, for me at least, I haven't seen any reason to jump ship. So this has probably been a couple of years ago. Um, I got a chance to play a one shot in Fantasy Grounds oh. when they first got the D and D partnership, and they put the uh, uh, Fandelver starter adventure. Right. Uh, and I got to play it with uh, Shane from Mundangerous and Total Party Thrill. Mm -hmm. So there, there's an episode of our show. I think it's like back when I mean somewhere in the 40s. Um, where we basically talked about fantasy grounds from our experience from the player side. Okay. Um, so if anybody would be interested, we did a little bit of comparing and contrasting to Roll20 because that was around the time that I was starting to play around with it. Okay. And, and I do think it kind of came down to fantasy grounds was better, but it wasn't better enough to pay for it when Roll20 was free. So I leaned towards staying with Roll20 because of the cost option, but I know a lot of people love fantasy grounds. Like they're hardcore yeah. diehards. So clearly it's doing something right. It just, again, I don't even use roll 20. So why would I pay for something I'm not going to use? Right. It also, it also got a lot of the official material first. Yes, it did. Yeah. Um, they got the early licenses and agreements. Yep. I mean, personally, it, if I were going to pay more, I would pay it to buy things like the monster manual, Volo's guide, the player's handbook. Um, as opposed to, it basically depends where you want to put your money and, and how they compare for you. Right. And again, as our kind of our motto is, if you're having fun, you're doing it right. So if you like Roll20, great. If you like Fantasy Grounds, great. If you like just using Google Hangouts, great. As long as you're I've, playing, that's all that matters. I've heard of people running games using Photoshop as their virtual tabletop. 
oh. where they just move things around and then they're using Google Hangouts for their video and voice. And so the players can't control anything, but the DM is still showing them visuals like scenes and maps and handouts. Yeah. And, you know, there's there's lots of ways to do it. Yeah. I mean, even we, we're using Zoom right now, which is basically Google Hangouts Plus, and we have share screen options. So, I mean, I don't think the functionality would be as, as seamless, but I could easily throw in pictures and you could see them and anybody who else was on the chat. Uh, so, yeah. So, you don't need anything. You just need to be able to see and hear people. And even then, that's optional. Uh, there's ways around that as well. So, uh, I think that's going to wrap everything up. Any last words from you, Jen? Uh, just thanks, everybody, for watching. Um, I'll answer any questions you can. And uh, if you would check out my art on my website, Twitter, YouTube, anything, I would super appreciate it. Yep. Uh, and I'll throw links in the show notes um, to all that great. stuff. If you want to send me an email with all of them, I'll just cut, copy and paste because I'm lazy. Absolutely. And I also <laughs> want to say, you know, I, I've always loved RPG Academy and it's a real honor to be here. You are one you, of our you patrons. Guys, you guys are my first podcast love. <laughs> you so. never forget your first. That's right. Yes. Uh, and we appreciate what you do for us. And again, I'm really looking forward to meeting you or seeing you, not meeting you at the faculty meeting or faculty retreat. Oh, yes. Uh, in March, late March. It, it, at at on undisclosed date at undisclosed location uh, location exactly yes uh, and then again at okay, are you going to be at Gen Con or Origins or any of those other cons I can't, I can't take uh. I probably can't take that much leave but uh, you know if I can only go to one con it's yours yes me too if I could only go to one it would be yeah. mine <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> awesome all right well enough shilling thank you again thanks for everybody who's watching we're going to sign off uh, we got to do our awkward wave out while I try to find that right button. Hi. Uh, there's the button. Bye. Bye. Thank you. All right. Dun dun dun. I think we're out of here now. So awesome. That was great. I apologize. I got Thank distracted. You.